Celtics and Pistons fans, I haven't forgot about you. Even if you don't like sports, you should find this interesting. And when we're looking at one of the best NBA and sports teams of all time, we have to look at the 1980s Los Angeles Lakers, specifically the 86-87 Lakers. This was not just one of the best NBA teams of the 80s, but of all time. And led by Magic Johnson, they would go 65-17, and win an NBA championship, and create the era of Showtime basketball. Spencer Haywood is out there. Nixon, Magic Johnson, and Kareem. Ford sends it to Kareem. Sky hook up and good. Lakers win. Score it. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar has given the Los Angeles Lakers a victory. And Magic Johnson is out there celebrating like they just won the NCAA championship. Hotline Hundley is out there. We've got Magic Man and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Abdul-Jabbar just... The LA Lakers of the 1980s were a decade-defining team during an era of decade-defining teams. This was the era of Showtime basketball, and the Lakers were the perfect made-for-TV sports team. But before we get to that, we need to find the origin of the Lakers. As a franchise, the LA Lakers actually go back to the 1940s. In 1947, they began as the Detroit Gems. Then they were moved to Minneapolis. If you ever wondered why Los Angeles is called the Lakers, it has to do with their Minneapolis origins. Minneapolis is the land of a thousand lakes, and the team would be called the Minneapolis Lakers. The team started out with a solid roster when they were part of the NBL. They would win the 1947-1948 NBL championship. The next year, they moved to the Basketball Association of America. After the 48-49 season, the NBL and the BAA merged to form the National Basketball Association, or the NBA. The Minnesota Lakers continued to dominate no matter what the league was called and would win another five championships. Going into the 1960 season, some top players had retired and attendance was waning. The Lakers drafted Jerry West, who is the model for the NBA logo, and the owner moved the team to Los Angeles. Even with the relocation, the Lakers didn't miss a beat and would appear in another four finals, losing each time to a team they would be connected to forever, the Boston Celtics. Now we're heading into the 1970s. In 1968, the Lakers would acquire a player that would help to define their franchise forever, Wilt Chamberlain. In that 1968 season, They yet again lost in the finals to the Celtics. In 1972, with the dominance of Chamberlain, the Lakers would finally win a championship. It would be their first championship in the NBA and their first one as the Los Angeles Lakers. It seemed as if Wilt Chamberlain was a franchise-defining player, but two new additions would come in that took them to an even higher level. The first was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and he came over from Milwaukee. Then there was the standout draft pick from Michigan. And there's a new kid on the NBA block, number 32. He's known far and wide as Irvin Johnson, nicknamed Magic. Last March, he led the Michigan State Spartans to a thrilling NCAA championship victory over Indiana State and Larry Bird. Now, Magic has packed his bag and moved to Hollywood. He joins forces with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Jamal Wilkes, Norm Nixon, and Spencer Haywood. And the man who is expected to put the go back in the Los Angeles Lakers is Magic Johnson. He's the most discussed newcomer to the L.A. basketball scene since another guard arrived, fella by the name of Jerry West. It's crazy to think these players were on the same team at the same time. 
Johnson was still a rookie, but showed a sixth sense on the court. His ability to find players with no-look passes made him extremely difficult to defend against. It took a while for the team to adopt to his style, but once they did, they were pretty unstoppable. In his rookie season, Magic Johnson would help lead the team to a 60-win season and an NBA championship. He picked up finals MVP honors at the same time. Not a bad first season. As the 80s began, the Lakers were already at the top of their game. For the 1981-82 season, Johnson would lose some time to injuries, but they had brought in a new coach, the legendary Pat Riley. With assistant coach Jerry West, the Lakers came out hot, winning 17 of the first 20 games. The Lakers had a fast break that was relentless. They were so big and moved so fast that it was a nightmare to defend against. This dynamic and very entertaining style of basketball earned them the name Showtime. As the 80s moved on, Lakers games had now become events. They were a super hot ticket and everyone wanted to catch a glimpse. Celebrities were now common occurrences at courtside, including a staple of the front row, Jack Nicholson. Having the Laker girls didn't hurt either. This really felt like the beginning when sports moved into show business. The Lakers were pushing the boundaries for presentation, and the game began to feel more like entertainment than merely just a sport. Example, the Laker girls wouldn't be cheerleaders, they would be dancers. Most of what you associate with modern sports as far as how they are packaged and presented started with the Showtime Lakers. The NBA had actually been struggling up to this point, and some say it was on the verge of bankruptcy. A team like the Lakers brought more eyes to the game, bigger TV contracts for the league, bigger endorsement deals and sponsorships, and ultimately more money. Magic Johnson also signed what was, at the time, the richest deal in sports history. He agreed to a 25-year, $25 million contract. The league value, endorsements, and TV contracts were nowhere near what they are today, but they were getting better, and a huge part of this was because of the Showtime Lakers. And I did an episode not too long ago, if you want to hear the story of the time Magic Johnson turned down a deal with an upstart shoe company named Nike. So go back and check that one out if you're interested. But everything was not rosy. In those early days, Johnson had complained about then-head coach Paul Westhead, He was outspoken in the media and was even demanding a trade. Westhead would end up getting fired after these remarks were made, but the owner of the Lakers, Jerry Buss, said they were not related. Sure, they weren't, Jerry. This is when Pat Riley was brought in. But the whole situation did not do Magic Johnson many favors. He was seen as disruptive and vilified in the media. He was constantly booed on the road, and the Showtime era made them easy to hate in other markets. Despite their dominance in the 80s, the Lakers were not always on top. In the 82-83 season, they lost in the finals in four straight games to the Philadelphia 76ers. In the 83-84 season, they again came out high and went 54-29. This brought them back to the finals against their old rivals, the Boston Celtics. This was the first time the two iconic teams had faced off in the finals since way back in 1969. The Lakers quickly went up two games to one, but the Celtics rallied and won three of the next four to secure the championship. For those keeping score at home, especially if you're from Boston, the Lakers were now 0-8 against the Celtics in a championship series. The next season, with motivation from the previous year's loss, the Lakers again came out hard. They easily won the Pacific Division and had a dominant playoff run. They would only lose two games during the Western Conference playoffs. This would bring them back to the finals against their old foes, the Celtics. L.A. got crushed in the first game, and it was looking like a familiar story. However, led by a 38-year-old and eventual MVP, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the Lakers would win the title in six games on the road in Boston. This was the only visiting team to ever win a championship in the legendary Boston Garden. Despite how dominant the Lakers have been over the years, There was one season that stood above all others.
truly iconic teams are able to not only define their league, but an entire era of the sport. Every sport has its dominant and iconic teams. The Oilers, the Canadians, the Patriots, the Yankees, the 49ers, the Bears, Man United, just to name a few. Each of these teams also has a few seasons that stand out even amongst several standout seasons. This is the case with the 86-87 Lakers. If the Showtime era began in the early 80s, they solidified it during the 86-87 season. Like the 95-96 Chicago Bulls, this is when everything was firing on all cylinders. Magic Johnson was also firing on all cylinders. His specific brand of offensive prowess was at its best. Similar to Wayne Gretzky's brilliance at the time, Magic's teammates had completely learned how to play with them, and opposing defenses struggled to contain it. If there was a league better than the NBA, Magic would be a star there too. For the 86-87 season, Magic would average 24 points a game, 12.2 assists, 6.3 rebounds, 1.7 steals per game, and a 52% shooting percentage. The league had never really seen a season like this before. Not only was Magic tearing it up on offense, but he was shutting it down on defense. To have just an offensive season like this would be remarkable, but it was also a standout defensive season all on its own. Not only was he averaging 12 assists a game, but he was also top 10 in scoring. This was pretty amazing. But it wasn't just Magic and Kareem. Byron Scott was the perfect finisher to Magic's passes. Scott also had a remarkable 43.6% three-point shooting percentage. It was hard to be noticed during Magic's standout season, but Byron Scott was an important piece of the puzzle. Next was James Worthy, another seemingly overlooked player, but perfectly complimented Magic Johnson. He had a lightning quick first step, but was also one of Magic's favorite targets for a no-look pass. At power forward was A.C. Green. He narrowly missed finishing the season, averaging a double-double per game. Despite not being a major star, he was one of those backbone-type players that every team needs. This guy was an Iron Man and only missed three games in his entire career. Again, cannot forget the legendary Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Despite getting on in years, their center was also their captain. Despite not being in his prime, he was still one of the best centers in the league. He averaged 17.5 points per game with 6.7 rebounds. A pretty amazing season for a 39-year-old. At 7 feet 2 inches tall, his legendary sky hook shot was almost indefensible. You basically needed a ladder to stop it. So you've got your household name starters, but the Lakers of that year had a really deep bench. The second unit contained Michael Cooper, an amazing perimeter defender, and the guy used to shut down the top outside shooter from every team they played. Cooper would be the defensive player of the year for the season, and he was on the bench. This is what I mean by depth. They also had Michael Thompson, the 6'10 power forward, was a finesse player and offensive threat. Despite averaging 20 points a game before he joined the Lakers, he needed to be assigned to the bench to come in and provide a spark. Kurt Rambis was another one of those grinders that every team needs. He might not have been pretty to watch, but got the job done. It goes on from there, but this is just to give you an idea of the individual skill this team possessed. But individual skill only gets you so far. You need to play as a unit. Not only could they do that, but they somehow assembled the perfect combination to play with Magic Johnson. Johnson was a unique player, and not everyone could adapt to his style. Fortunately for the 86-87 Lakers, everyone was in sync with him. The Lakers ran the floor fast and pushed the tempo. This was pure Showtime Lakers basketball. You didn't even have to like basketball to be entertained by this team. I'm a hockey guy through and through, but there are just some teams from other sports that you are drawn to watch. This team was one of them. The Lakers were just so damn fast, and it looked like Every player was trying to clock their best 40-yard dash time every time they moved down the court with the ball. They could slow things down and leave opposing teams bewildered by what was coming next. It was really hard to prepare a game plan to face these Lakers. So now a dominant record turns into a dominant postseason. And like with all great teams, you need a great coach to put it all together. Just think Vince Lombardi. Scotty Bowman, Phil Jackson. Pat Riley had an insatiable appetite to win. He not only had a team overrunning with talent, he knew how to get the best out of them. The 86 87 Lakers went on to an incredible 65 and 17 season. 
It's hard to imagine a team like this ever losing a game. If they did, God help the opposing team the next night. They then rode this dominant play right into the next or that year's playoffs. They beat the Denver Nuggets in three games, beat Golden State in five games, then swept the Seattle Supersonics to win the conference. And who would be waiting for them in the NBA Finals? None other than the team that was a key part of their history, the Boston Celtics. The Lakers had peaked going into the finals, and their relentless pace would be too much for that year's Celtics. The Lakers would win the championship four games to two. Magic had a series for the ages, including an iconic skyhook shot to win game four. He would finish the finals with 26.2 points per game, 13 assists, 8 rebounds, and 2.3 shots blocked per game. A ridiculous stat line that almost saw him average a triple-double for the first time in finals history. Even Larry Bird had to admit that Magic Johnson was unstoppable at this point in his career. Let's look at a few more of the stats for this season. So the record, 65-17. and 17. Their offense was number one in the league. Their defense was number seven in the league. They beat teams by an average of 9.3 points. That's pretty good. Their playoff record was 15-3. and three. The season MVP was Magic Johnson. The finals MVP, also Magic Johnson. So it didn't end there, but all good things have to come to an end. It's not that the 86-87 season was the end of the Lakers, far from it. This was just the team at their absolute peak. In the coming years, they were still dominant, just not quite as dominant as this year. In the 87-88 season, they would go 62-20 and and start the playoffs sweeping the Spurs. But this is where things would get tough. They were taken to seven games by the Jazz, featuring a young John Stockton and Carl Malone. Then another Game 7, this time against the Dallas Mavericks. They would again get to the NBA Finals, this time going up against the bad boys from Detroit, the Pistons. In yet another seven-game series, the Lakers would come out with the win. This would be their fifth championship in nine years, but it would also be their last for more than a decade. They still had an amazing season. It just wasn't as dominant as 86-87. For the 88-89 season, they still won 57 games. This time, they had an easier run in the playoffs, sweeping through the early rounds. This, again, would bring them up against the Detroit Pistons in the finals where the Lakers got swept. Kareem would announce his retirement after this season. The next year, despite winning their ninth consecutive division crown, they would get knocked out in the second round of the playoffs. As the 90s began, the Showtime era seemed to have come to a close. They failed to win the division for the first time in 10 years. Despite all this, they would cruise through that year's playoffs, bringing them to yet another NBA Finals, their ninth trip in 12 years. But this time, they came up against a new player and a new dynasty ready to take flight, Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls. The era of Air Jordan had now begun. So how do the 86-87 Lakers match up against other iconic teams? These discussions are almost impossible, but they're still fun to have. It's great to debate how different iconic teams would be if they had to play each other. How would the Montreal Canadiens of the 1970s do against the great Edmonton Oilers of the 1980s? How would the 86-87 Lakers do against other iconic teams such as the Bulls in their prime, the Milwaukee Bucks of the early 70s, LeBron's 2015-2016 year with the Cavs or Golden State with Steph Curry. Again, almost impossible to compare these different eras in sport. So many things change and there are so many variables to consider. Some eras were not as big on defense. Some eras were more physical and you wouldn't get the calls you do today. But with those Lakers, their speed would transfer over to any era of basketball. This might be the thing that could actually let them compete no matter what the year was. Modern teams might have trouble containing them and the free-flowing style of offense might overwhelm modern defenses. Or defensive-minded teams may find a way to contain the Showtime Lakers. Would physicality be enough to slow them down or would this lead to too many fouls? Basically, we'll never know, but it's always fun to speculate. The 80s were a golden age of the NBA. Besides the 86-87 Lakers, you also had the 85-86 Celtics, 
the 82-83 Philadelphia 76ers, and the 88-89 Detroit Pistons. All these teams have been considered to be in the top 10 greatest NBA teams of all time, and they all existed within a few years of each other. Were these Lakers the best team of the 80s? They might very well be. It all depends on who you ask. No one from Boston would ever admit this. Neither would someone from Detroit, even Philly. From an outsider's perspective, they were definitely the most notable. The Showtime era of the Lakers caught the sports world by storm. Everyone knew who Magic was, and the Lakers were must-see TV before this was even a thing. Whether they had the best team of the 80s remains up for debate, but definitely in the conversation. What doesn't seem up for debate is how astounding this 86-87 season was. Is it the best in league history? Again, up for debate. Many may go with the 95-96 Bulls, but this Lakers team is still in the mix. The Lakers are such an iconic franchise, this team may not even be the best Lakers team ever. But as more time goes by, it's a season that continues to astonish. The 80s were an amazing time for the NBA and sports in general. New stars were being born and it gave us multiple dynasties all at once. As sports continue to evolve, it's become much tougher to build dynasties. In an era of salary caps, teams relocating, and players leaving for better deals, it can be very difficult to repeat a championship, let alone win one, let alone win several in a row. A three-peat now seems unfathomable. And the last team to do it? The Lakers in 2002. There seemed to be an abundance of sporting dynasties in the 80s. Besides the Lakers, Celtics, and Pistons of the NBA, in the NHL you had the Edmonton Oilers. They won four Stanley Cups in 1984, 85, 87, and 88. They didn't three-peat, but if it wasn't for a fluke play in 1986, may have won five straight. The New York Islanders of the 80s had a three-peat and even won four in a row, making them the last team of the four main professional North American sports to do so. This has now stood for nearly 40 years. The 49ers won three Super Bowls in the 80s and another one in 1990, which was still connected to the 1989 season, so I'm counting it. It was an awesome time to be a sports fan, and dynasties just seem normal. Some complain that dominant teams aren't good for the sport, but I love it. I love to witness teams that will go on to define an era, and it makes it more interesting to see who might take them down. When that dynasty eventually falls, it makes that win even more significant. With a different team winning the championship every year, it never seems as notable. During the 80s, we not only got several of these iconic dynasties, but we also got to watch it all play out right in front of our eyes. So let's finish it there. Hopefully you like this look back, more of a sports-centered episode, but also, you know, an interesting look at this time of dynasties in the 80s. And again, how the Showtime Lakers transform the production and presentation of pro sports, everything from, you know, in between plays and halftime shows and uh, more entertainment and uh, competitions going on while the game is pot, all that sort of stuff, everything that seems normal at a sporting event really started because of the Lakers. So I also want to welcome some new members on Patreon, including Andrew P., Keith K., and Aaron S. And if you're in a position to do so and, and you're interested in supporting small independent podcasts like this, you can check out patreon.com slash 80. So for as little as a few bucks a month, you get to support the show, but you get audio rewards too. And there are different tier levels, uh, like the middle tier, you get access to the Everything 80s Movie Club, where I review all the classics, good and bad, of the 1980s. If you want to learn more, just see what it's all about, just head on over to patreon.com slash 80s, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash 80s, or wherever you're listening to this on, whatever app, uh, in the show description, the show notes, there'll be a link that'll take you right there. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you for listening. I'll be back soon with a new episode. Don't you dare miss it.